What's up, guys? We are on the 35th anniversary of the Ronald Gene Simmons murders. Um, back in 1987, December of 87, uh, he committed this crime. He killed all of his family members and then went to Russellville and killed some other people. But I've had the opportunity to interview the lead investigator at the time, uh, Ray Caldwell. He was a lieutenant then. He has since retired with 39 years of service as the captain. Uh, with the Pope County Sheriff's Office. I sat down with Ray and got his perspective on the the, the murders and all that good stuff and kind of how it started, how it ended and everything. Um, you can go on YouTube, you can go anywhere, and you can find stories on the Ronald Gene Simmons stuff. I wanted to just get Ray's perspective from Ray as a law enforcement officer. Uh, Ray's done interviews and they've spliced it in with other stuff over the past and showed pictures and talked to other people and all this good stuff. I just want to sit down and talk to Ray. Uh, about Ray's experience. So anyway, here's a, a short little video of Ray and I's conversation about the uh, Ronald Gene Simmons murders back in 1987. So hope you enjoy. Well, and you know, we was here at the sheriff's office and we got a call, you know, a shooting. First shooting was down at the attorney's office uh, where a secretary was killed. And then from there, we had a shooting over here at the service station, which was right down here from the sheriff's office uh, where a lady was shot in the neck and another guy was shot at. And then from there, we had a, another call back on the west side of town out at Taylor's uh, uh, oil distributor where uh, ex fireman was, uh, well, he wasn't ex fireman, he was fireman, was working down there off duty and got shot and killed. And then uh, Mr. Taylor was shot. And then his officers were responding out there, they was going back across town. And then the last time he was out here at a trucking company where he shot a lady out there, and that's where he was taken into custody. After Simmons was taken into custody, uh, you know, welfare check for his family because nobody had heard from him, you know, in a few days. And that's when we proceeded out to his uh, residence, which was out on uh, Morgan Road out there. So when all the shooting was going on, though, y'all didn't have a clue who was doing it or what was happening. Y'all were just boom, boom, We boom. didn't. At that time, you know, we didn't know who, you know, who had done it, uh, you know, involved in the shooting. Uh, but, you know, we was getting calls that he was going from this side of town to the other side of town. And like I said, after he was taken into custody, uh, with, you know, we went to the residence to do a welfare check. Uh, when we got to the residence, you know, there was vehicles parked in front of the, in front of the yard. And the house was locked up. Uh, had a big sliding door and you couldn't get in it. The curtains pulled. Uh, we found a window that was unlocked uh, there at the kitchen. And that's why we was able to look in. When we looked in, we could see, you know, bodies laying on the ground or on the floor that had been covered up. Uh, we made entry into the house for welfare check where we found his daughter. Uh, she was there in front of the Christmas tree on the floor with a blanket over her. Uh, her husband, his son-in-law, was at the uh, front door. He was laying there dead and uh, had a blanket over him in the kitchen uh dining room area uh, there at the table his daughter-in-law she was laying against the wall on the floor uh, she was covered up with a blanket and his son was laying by her on the floor with a blanket uh, covering him uh, their small baby uh, at that time we didn't know where it was uh, and then his daughter by his daughter uh, because he molested his daughter in Arizona and she had a baby by him and when we proceeded down the hallway in places, uh, we found her in a bed uh, covered up. She had a yellow fish stringer uh, around her neck, looking through where she had been strangled to death. Mm. Uh, when we proceeded on down the hallway into the you know narrow hallway, when the bedroom, which was the master bedroom, uh, there was uh, blood all over the pillow and the uh, sheets and stuff there in the bedroom which was him in his wife's bedroom and she was nowhere to be found uh, and then across the hallway which was a narrow real narrow hallway uh, there was another bedroom and there was blood all over the uh, bedding and stuff and there was also blood splattered on the walls and the ceiling in that bedroom uh, we proceeded to you know check things out which uh, you know we had two infant babies missing uh, at that time plus his wife, his son, who was visiting from Arizona, and his other four children that was in school. Uh, during the process of uh, searching, you know, we were searching the pond and all the wooded areas around it. 
uh, I believe it was uh, Lieutenant Bradley at that time, found a bunch of tin that was over the uh, ground uh, out there and rocks on top of it. And uh, so we proceeded to pull it back and you could tell it was fresh dug dirt. And we proceeded to dig into the uh, pit and we'd run it into bob wire, rocks and dirt because he'd laid it with rocks, oh, and, wow. uh, rocks and bob wire all the way down. And when we finally got down deep enough, you know, we discovered one of the bodies um, in the pit, which was one of his children. And uh, he had poured some kind of a cellarant, either, uh, I don't know where it was, uh, uh, wasn't gasoline or diesel. It was something, you know, along that line, uh, kerosene, I believe it was, that he had poured in to on top of the bodies in the grave before he covered them up. But we ended up down in the grave pulling his wife and his son, oldest son from Arizona, plus his other four children out of the grave there uh, where he had put them. Uh, we, you know, we recovered those bodies. And from what we could figure out during the crime scene and working it, uh, he had sent his children uh, four off to school. And uh, his wife and his uh, son from Arizona was there at the house. And from what we could figure, he'd walk back and his wife was still in bed and he shot her in the side of the head. And that, uh, like I said, right across the hallway was where his other son was from Arizona. And he shot him, but evidently it did not kill him, you know, right off the bat because there was a fight that occurred, you know, after he was shot. Oh, wow. And there was, uh, you know, marks on his head where he had been beaten, gashes, but there was blood, uh, you know, from the fight that was splashed up on the ceiling and on the walls in the bedroom. Uh, from what we could determine after he'd killed both of them, he had took them out and put them in the pit out there, the hole that they had dug. And uh, he waited on his children to come in from school and he brought them in evidently one at a time and strangled them uh, there. I um, mean, he used uh, neckties and stranger fish strangers and different things like that and he strangled each one of his children and then he'd put them in the pit out there and covered them up uh he had waited at the house and i don't know what day or what but his uh daughter daughter-in-law and son arrived with their small infant child and they were sitting at the kitchen table where she was shot uh I think she was shot like seven times. And then his son was also shot there. Uh, they was laying, like I said, on the floor in the kitchen dining room area against the wall. And uh, he had covered them up with blankets and their small infant child. Uh, he'd strangled uh, the baby. And he had five gallon, bar. well, there's more than five gallons. There's big trash cans full of water in the house. And from what we found out, that he had submerged the babies after he had strangled them down in the uh, big uh, tubs full of water. And uh, at that time, they was the first one that we, you know, that was killed like that. And then his daughter and his daughter by his daughter, in which he had molested his daughter while he was in Arizona, and she had a baby by him. Uh, and their infant and uh, his son-in-law came and. He shot his daughter there by the Christmas tree, and when she fell uh, right by the Christmas tree in the living room, evidently he went over to the door, and his son-in-law come running in the door, and he shot him in the side of the head, and he fell right at the door uh, there at the house. Uh, then he uh, strangled his, his granddaughter, or his daughter by his daughter at that time, and then he also strangled the infant, the infant baby and uh, also submerged it. Uh, at that time, we had everybody accounted for except the two infant babies, and uh, we uh, had searched, and we went up out and uh, behind the house and some old cars out there, and then we opened up the trunk, and inside the trunk, we found a black trash bag that had been taped and uh, pulled around, and opened it up, and there was one of the infant babies inside the trash can with a you know, ligature around its neck where it had been strangled. And we opened up another car uh, next to it, and inside the trunk of that car, we also found uh, trash bags that had wrapped up. And when we opened it up, it was also the other infant baby mm. uh, there at the house. Wow.
Now, when y'all arrested him and made contact with him, did he tell you any no. of this information, or y'all just went on there on a hunch on a welfare check? And he never found said, everybody. He never said a thing about the murder, even up to the day he was executed. So y'all had no idea what you were walking into at the house. We, now, how did y'all deduce who got killed in what order and all that good stuff? Well, from what we could put together, uh, you know, uh, you take okay, if his daughter and son-in-law would have been at the door. His son and daughter wouldn't have come in the house and sat at the mm. table. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we knew the children came home from school. And, uh, you know, so we knew that happened. And it was a couple of days later when his daughter and uh, son and their families came in. So, you know, you pretty well put down, put a timeline together yeah. on the accounts that happened uh, through what we was able to find out. And now, did he use the same weapon throughout? 20 to 22, 22 pistols. Just kept reloading? And right. How many shots total did y'all ever come up with an amount? Well, I, I think his daughter, daughter-in-law, she was shot like about seven times because you could tell she was against the wall and fighting as she was being shot because she was blood was being slung everywhere and she had it all over where she was rubbing her face and, and stuff where she had been shot. Uh, and then her, her, his son there, I think he was shot two or three times, mm. you know what I mean? So, and then uh, his daughter, uh, I think she, I don't remember exactly how many times, she wasn't shot but a couple times, but his son-in-law, I think he was shot one time uh, in the side of the head. Uh, it's crazy the fact that he shot the older people and then strangled the, I mean, strangling somebody so personal, and to strangle a little baby, my well, yeah, gosh. You, you take, you know, he... Uh, he strangled his own daughter by his daughter, and then his two grand grandchildren, you know, little, and then his own other kids, you know, he strangled them. Now, was there anything left in the house that kind of led up to why he did it, or a note, or the, anything? The that... only thing that we was able to uh, determine, her sister, uh, she was... His wife's sister? No, his, his wife's sister, yes. Mm. She lived over in, I don't remember over in the eastern part of the United States. And uh, from what we was able to find out, she was fixing to leave him. It was an abusive you know, relationship, kind of. And I think she was going to take the children and go over there. So it could be he found out? Uh, yes. Uh, according to a letter, you know, that we received, you know, that was sent to, his, you know, to her sister. Mm. But he never did admit to nothing. So once he killed all of them, he just decided, well, I'm headed to town to right, right some wrongs that right. went on he, he stayed, at my jobs. He stayed there for a couple of days at the house after he killed everybody with them in the floor and all of that. Hmm. He was there a couple of days before he come to Russellville and done this. Hmm. Yeah, that's just crazy, man. So when he came to Russellville, was that still the same gun? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, so he had ammo and everything oh, yeah, on him? Yeah, and... yeah, that was the same. Well, yeah, I assume because he had more than one gun. But, you know, twenty two was what was used here in town, and also a twenty two was what was used up there. And he just surrendered, right? He... Well, at first, after he shot him, he kind of barricaded himself in out there at the trucking place, and finally, you know, he gave up. Mm. Yeah, there were so many officers out there at the time because, you know, like I said, it's going back across town because we was getting a call. Uh, you know, the first shooting down there by the forestry service at the lawyer's office, you know, where the secretary was killed. And then the next shooting was, you know, right out here past the sheriff's office uh, on West Ma or East Main. And then the next shooting was all the way back on the west side of town at Taylor's uh, oil deal. And then the next shooting was all the way back out here on the east side of town. So he was driving back across yeah. town, you know, when officers were going one way, he was going the other way. So what was with the secretary at the lawyer? What was his beef with her? I, I don't know exactly what the beef was. It was something over her papers or something. He he was kind of fatuated with some of the women that, uh, you know, that... That was the Kendrick yeah, woman, right? right? He made advances to her yeah. or something at one right. point? Hmm. Yeah, that is just a strange case. So when y'all went out there and ask, uh, I mean, when you take a body to the coroner, they've got a lot to do. But when you've got that many bodies, did y'all have coroners come in from other no. areas, or was that coroner just no, no, they was taking all, over everything? No, the coroner only, you know, our coroner here, and then they was all transported to, you know, the Little Rock State Crime mm. Lab, where you know autopsies and everything was done at Little Rock. 
Uh, but at the time, it may have changed now, but at the time when this happened, it was the worst family massacre in the nation's history. Yeah, history. I think it still is. Yeah, it, yeah. it's a good chance it probably still is. But. So other agencies, I'm assuming, came in and helped? And Well, mostly it was just the sheriff's office. The state police helped on it. Uh, you know, state police was up there helping us on it, uh, the investigator that was here. Uh, but, you know, the city... You know, the city, uh, all of these shootings took a place inside the Russell City limits. So that went to so them. So, we, you know, the city worked that part of it as far as the shootings because we concentrated on the, you know, crime scene and everything that we had out in the county. Yeah. And so the city of Russville, their detectives and that worked the, uh, you know, shootings and the murders inside the city. Hmm. So he once he got arrested, now he just waived all of his rights, right? He just wanted to be executed immediately, kind of thing. That wanted he wanted he wanted that, but several other inmates on death row down there filed appeals on his behalf. With you know he didn't want it; he wanted to be executed immediately. Uh, but they filed appeals down there to try to stop his execution because they was on death row. Mm. So they figured, you know. I mean, if you've done all that and you just want to immediately get it, why not just kill yourself? Why not suicide by cop? You know, yeah. I just, it's strange that he did all that and then he wanted to be arrested. He wanted to go to jail and he wanted to be executed. Uh, you, know, I, you know, that really surprised me because I figured, you know, he'd want to be. Yeah, just you know, end, end it, you know. Killed. This is why I did this and now I'm killing myself and blah, blah. But, you know, he, he never did it. He never did admit hmm. anything. So how long was he in jail before he got executed? What, like yeah, two years? years. Two uh, years. I think it's like two years. He was on death row before he was executed. Something like that. Now, when the court stuff all went on, were they calling you back as a witness? Did they did they have to do all that or no? Uh, no. When once we had a trial, see, they had a change of venue on the trial. They didn't try it here in Polk County. The trial was held in Johnson County. Mm, uh, interesting. Yeah, the, uh, they had a change of venue, and a trial was uh, held at the, like I said, at Johnson County Courthouse is where the trial was held. Is that because the Pope County affiliation? They just thought. Well, well yeah, see, so, you know, Johnson, Pope Johnson, and Franklin County is all in the uh, same district. So the change of venue went to Johnson County because they figured it'd be so prejudiced in Pope County for mm, what we've done yeah. because inside the city and then out in the county, you know, that they couldn't get a. Uh, you know, a fair jury because of everything that happened. So that's the reason they had a change of venue that went to Johnson County. So what happened after, like, the house? So once everything was done, I mean, did you guys board up the house? No, we, uh, after we took all of our evidence and, you know, and stuff from the, you know, house, all of that, of course, his attorneys uh, that he had then, uh, they got everything that was up there that was worth anything for his, for his fees for his fees and stuff. And then finally, you know, over the years uh, after it happened, you know, there wasn't nobody there. And uh, kids was going up there and going in the house. And it finally ended up, you know, they, it finally ended up burnt. Up there. Mm. Probably the best. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hmm. So that was 35 years ago, man, and you're still getting asked questions about it. I mean, how did it affect you? Was Well... Because you were the guy that walked in the door, right? The first, oh, I mean, yeah. weren't you filming it? Your uh, well, camcorder? Well, I had somebody it? else filming it. Okay. Other, and you were narrating? I was narrating and doing it through the crime scene. So, I mean, that's got to be seeing the dead kids and the children. Children, in my 39 years of working in law enforcement, the children always bothered me more than anything else because, I mean, you cannot get to see cold, cold hardly. But let me tell you, if you are working in law enforcement, and you take that stuff home with you, you will go crazy. You yeah. have to, when you walk out of the office, you try to go do something, get it out of your mind. That's the reason so many officers and that drink and all of that stuff. But me, I just went home with work and done some, get it off your mind. Yeah. Because if you don't, it'll drive you crazy. Do you think it's ever going to go away for you? I mean, people are always having you do interviews and asking you questions and stuff. And In 39 years, I... I don't know how many murder cases and stuff that I work, uh, you know, had one case when I started in 1970, uh, in 71, we had three little girls here. They come up missing. I worked on that case for probably 35, 36 years before we ended up solving it. Wow. And uh, found two of the skeleton remains and was able to identify two of them, the other one, Anyway, the guy, he finally confessed to us after 30-something, well, it's like 20-something years, nearly 30, 
And anyway, he's done life and you know, three life sentences in the penitentiary plus one out of Missouri. But oh worked, my goodness! I worked on that case for years too. I mean, there's, there's a lot of cases that murder cases and stuff that I worked on. Well, I worked everything because I was head of the criminal investigation division for thirty some years. Hmm. None like this one though, huh? Oh no, this <laughs> this 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 one was something else. Yeah. Well, that's it. I appreciate you. I mean, I. I I've heard about it. I mean, I was, I just graduated high school when it happened, so I was just a kid, and I don't even, you know, when you're a kid, you just don't think about stuff like that, but just over the years, it kept, you know, you kept seeing stuff and seeing stuff and seeing stuff, and I thought, man, I would love to get to know the guy that was actually there that walked through the door and, you know, was uh, on yeah. scene, because everybody hears about, you know, the guy and the kids and everything else, but nobody ever really kind of got your perspective or in detail. Well, I've done a... Uh... I guess it's about six years ago, I guess it was. I'd done a documentary, hour-long documentary with uh, Oxygen Channel on it. Mm. And they, about every Christmas they air it, because they do all their murders in yeah. Christmas. Yeah, now, you know, on yeah. Christmas homicide. So it's probably airing now, I don't know, off and on through for now to Christmas. Yeah. I've done mm. that one back, that's been about five years ago, the last one I've done. Yeah, this is the 35 year anniversary, man. It's just. <laughs> It don't seem like it's been that long. I was going to ask you, does it seem like it's been 35 years? No, it don't seem like it's been that long. Hmm. Well, Ray, I appreciate you sitting down with me and talking with me and well, all that good stuff. Well. I appreciate you coming in and getting your perspective on everything. And Well, there you go, guys. Uh, Ray was the guy that, you know, run the entire investigation. He, Like I said, he was the lead investigator. He was the lieutenant at the time. Uh, Ray put in 39 years of service with the Pope County Sheriff's Office. He retired um, as the captain, and he gets interviews like this all the time. But uh, Ray was very generous to sit down with me uh, and go over the details of what happened and all that good stuff. And uh, I want to thank him for doing that for me. I want to thank uh, the Sheriff of Pope County, uh, Shane Jones, for allowing us to use the, the facility there at the Pope County Sheriff's Office. I want to thank my buddy, uh, Jim Lean, for kind of setting all this up uh, and helping me getting it going and getting all this in motion. And then uh, Jonathan Paz uh, was my camera operator during the time. I want to thank him for that. But anyway, guys, if, if you know somebody that was affected by this or if you remember where you were at or what you were doing during this time, I'd love to hear it in the comments below uh, and see how this affected you or, or if you even remember it or if you're old enough to remember it. But uh, anyway, guys, that's it. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out.